Hello, everybody. Hello, welcome to another RPG first look. Uh, today's first look is it a game that I had in my library and never had an opportunity to really look at for a while. Um, I'm not sure how long, but I remember when I when I first heard from Sean Tompkin reached out to me and was like, "Hey, would you be interested in doing a first look at Iron Sworn?" I was like, "This looks so familiar." And uh, and Sean sent me over the, the PDF of the game and I was like, wait a second. No, I definitely have this game already. I remember being recommended it, but I never really got a chance to dig into it. And so I'm really I'm really excited to uh, to dig in. Now, before we start, before we start, I do want to uh, just let everybody know the format of these RPG first looks, because. You know, I, I may have been remiss in earlier first looks in assuming that people understood what we were doing here. So I'm going to reiterate at the beginning of the video, I have not read this this game. This is not a review of Iron Sworn, right? If it were a review, I would read the game, I would play the game, I would make a bunch of notes, and I probably wouldn't do it live because I'd want to cut together a video explaining all the various parts that I, I thought about the game. Instead, leveraging this, this live improvised environment in which I create content, what I do is literally take a first look at a role playing game. So what you're seeing me look at here, what I'm talking about is the very first time I've dug into the game I'm discussing, right? Some of these first looks are games that I've just like personally become interested in. Some of them are big, big new releases, right? Like we've done Pathfinder in the past, um, Mutant Crawl Chronicles, um, games that are of, of personal interest to me, right? Other games are developers coming to me and saying, hey, would you like to take a look at my game? And usually with a cursory glance, I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, I love new games. Give it to me. So today's today's first look is sponsored by the developer of Ironsworn uh, by Sean Tompkin. And it is the first time I'm going to be delving into this material. So there's going to be there's going to be stuff that I'm going to miss. I'm going to gloss over things. Basically, I'm treating it like if I were in a game store and I picked it up and I just started flipping through it. What impression would I get? It is a, uh, a, a first impression of the game, a brand new approach. And we're going to take a look at what the game has to say. And as always, we're going to try to answer the three questions, right? What is Iron Sworn about? Mechanically, how is Iron Sworn about that? What are the characters I guess the players, through their characters, what are the players rewarded for doing, right? Jared's three questions, my kind of guide through a brand new role playing game, and the kind of thing that I use to kind of discover games. Now, with games that are brand brand new or not released yet that have a Kickstarter, I'll usually start there, right? We'll take a look at the Kickstarter, we'll dig in, and uh, we'll, we'll watch the video or whatever, but Iron Sworn's been out for a little bit and is in print, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by looking at their uh, their website. We're going to take a look at the Iron Sworn website. What does Iron Sworn tell us in its marketing material that it is a game about? And then we're going to we're going to see if the mechanisms of the game prove it out. So in this game, Iron Sworn, a tabletop RPG of perilous quests. And if you want to if you want to to, to follow along, you want to check it out uh, in chat, you can use the command exclamation mark Iron Sworn. Uh, you can go to bit.ly slash ironsworn.fl for first look. Both of those will take you to uh, to a page where you can follow along. You can buy Ironsworn yourself uh, in, uh, in PDF or in uh, print form. So, Ironsworn, Perilous Quests. This is the bit that got me interested. Right? Solo, co-op, and guided play. Solo co-op and guided play. Interesting. That that bit grabbed me, right? That bit I was like, three different play modes, same role-playing game, challenging business. I am very curious. There's not a lot of solo RPGs outside of the kind of short form experimental uh, space. I'm excited. I'm excited about this idea, right? 
So let's uh, let's take a let's take a look at what else is going on. So, in the Iron Sworn tabletop role playing game, you are a hero sworn to undertake perilous quests in the dark fantasy setting of the Iron Lands. Others live out their lives, hardly venturing beyond the walls of their village or steading, but you're different. You will explore untracked wilds, fight desperate battles, forge bonds with isolated communities, and reveal the secrets of this harsh land. Are you ready to swear iron vows and see them fulfilled, no matter the cost? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I am. So, uh, guided play is what they call GM style, right? One or more players take the role of their characters while the game master moderates the session. Okay, sure. Or co-op mode, you and one or more friends play together to overcome challenges and complete quests. No GM required. Or solo mode, you portray a lone character driven to fulfill vows in a dangerous world. Good luck. Interesting. So whatever mode you choose, you'll create your character, make some decisions about the world you inhabit, and set the story in motion. When you encounter something dangerous or uncertain, your choices in the dice determine the outcome. Okay, all right. So you have a character made out of stats and trackers. We'll take a closer look at that in the actual game. Uh, the game's setting is a gritty fantasy on a rugged frontier, right? Uh, you're encouraged to make Iron Sworn your own. You'll define aspects such as the history of your people, magic, mythic beasts, and much more. I'm curious to see how we do that. Um, there are monsters. Look at this big fish boy. Uh, magic is subtle, evocative, and mysterious. Um, performed through rituals. Right? Okay. Uh, often used to protect Ironlanders from horrors and monstrous beasts. Legends and nightmares made real. If it suits your version of the Ironlands, rituals and mythic creatures can be ignored entirely. Right. Okay. Interesting. So it's either like, yes, mysticism and monsters, or if you don't like them, no. Right. We're seeing, obviously, like there's some some Viking vibes in terms of the the gear. Right. That we're seeing the fur. Obviously, this is like a Viking style boat. We shall require a bigger vessel. <laughs> yeah, fair. Um, so here we go. Iron vows in the Iron Lands. A vow is sacred. When you declare your solemn promise to serve or aid someone, your honor is bound to that vow. When you swear a vow, you touch a piece of iron. It's an old tradition. Some say the iron is a conduit to the old gods so they may better hear your promise. Vows are at the core of playing Iron Sworn. It is your vows that drive you. These goals create context for your adventures and challenges. As you fulfill vows, you gain experience and new abilities. So we're getting hints already, right? What are we rewarded for? Fulfilling our vows. The vows matter in game and out of the game, right? Personal goals. Uh, the system uh, moves help you determine what happens when you do something uncertain or dangerous. Moves are inspired by the innovative fiction first mechanisms of games such as Apocalypse World and that other bullshit game that ripped it off. And then momentum is a track which is core to playing Iron Sworn. When you have positive momentum, you're building on your successes and ready to make decisive moves. When you have negative momentum, you've suffered setbacks and your quest is in jeopardy. You can use momentum to gain a decisive result on a crit or avoid, avoid dire failure on a critical move. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. All right. So we got goal oriented play. We got moves, though I'm not sure we'll see. Uh, how that kicks in. We've got momentum, which I'm particularly interested in, right? I like the idea of, it's like, um. remember when we did our prep for that Warhammer Fantasy 4th Edition one shot and how momentum in combat was a thing where it was like, the more you're winning, the easier it is to keep winning and the more you're losing, the harder it is to win, right? I think that's interesting. It can kind of give you an idea of when to bail out. So I'm curious to see how that is in the game. Uh, and then um, oracles, which are tables, right? Remember, tables are setting. This has become one of these kind of core things that I find myself repeating over and over when we look at these games is that like system matters, right? Because the system creates the narrative. Narrative is the story that you will tell about your game later, right? So system matters. And random tables are setting. 
So this is interesting. We'll see what what setting information is imparted by these oracles to answer questions. And I think these are crucial to solo or co-op play, right? They can stand in for the GM in certain circumstances. Uh, cool. All right. And then we get down to all the downloads and stuff. So uh, the game is free to download uh, or you can buy a print version of it. That's pretty cool. Um, and then there's some other stuff. They're working on Iron Sworn Delve, which is quests in forbidden places. That looks like it's a supplement. And then uh, there is a little pay what you want um, reference guide, which is quite cool, too. And then there's all of our assets. Yeah. Cool. So this is what this is what the game says to us that it is about. This is what Sean wants us to know about the game. This is a good link to have too. If you're interested in learning more about how Iron Sworn works, you can listen to Ask the Oracle, which is like an official. They have a podcast for it, which is really cool. But let's take a look at it ourselves, right? I'm not. I'm not here to just. I'm not here to just tell you about what the game's website wants us to think. We're gonna look at the game itself. So this is this is our cover. This is Iron Sworn. Uh, a tabletop RPG of perilous quests. I imagine what we're looking at here is a warrior swearing an oath, right? Key to the game. This is this is ostensibly a character in the game touching touching iron, swearing an oath. Uh, I like, and I wonder if this is going to continue. I like that the cover art is a modified photograph. Um, we don't see this a lot. Uh, a lot of RPG art is inspired by photos, right? We have even going all the way back to like Elmore and them. There are, it's like clearly photos and then the pose are, uh, the pose is painted or um, like Apocalypse World. It's photographs that are deeply modified, right? So I'm curious to see if the rest of the art is also uh, photographs. Uh, I think that's quite cool. And it, it has an effect, not to go too deeply into the idea of like, we could we could spend the whole rest of this time talking about how photography as art affects you differently than a drawn image, right? But we won't get into that. That's a whole other thing. So Iron Sworn, tabletop RPG of perilous quests. So written and designed by Sean Tompkin, licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution non-commercial share alike 4.0 license. So that's cool. You can like make stuff for it. Uh, it acknowledges Apocalypse World, City of Judas, some bullshit RPG nobody likes, Fate, and Mythic. I don't know anything about City of Judas or Mythic, but that's cool. It's nice seeing them on that list. Uh, and that's part of why I love these these acknowledgments, right? It gives you an idea of what to expect, but it also lets you know other games that if you like this one, you might want to check those out, right? Um, and then there you go, yeah, selected icons and stock image uh, images where they are where they are pulled from. Cool. All right. So Iron Sworn. Let's let's dive into it. Let's skip through all this stuff, and let's get right into how does this game work. Oh, that's cool. That's a cool black and white photo of a sword. <laughs> All right. Chapter one. How does this game work? So Iron Sworn and and this pulls it pulls my eye right to right to this core core thing. The first thing I'm going to look at on this page is not at the top of the page. It's this box. Iron Sworn is primarily intended for solo and small group play. One to four players plus a GM in guided mode is ideal. The characters portrayed by the other players are referred to in these rules as your allies. Okay, all right. So allies are other player characters. Now that's an interesting, the use of language there is interesting. It's not fellow PCs, it is allies. It is a game term and it implies that the other player characters, this is not a game about PvP. This is not a game about competing with other characters to get shit done it's about you and your allies and you all see each other as allies i think that's important right the way the thing that we that we name the various roles in the game does say something uh, about it right i'm one of those people that believes that calling a, a single player the game master creates a hierarchy 
in games, right? I think that that's a, a thing. Choosing names for stuff is important. So we talked already a little bit about guided play, which is the traditional D&D mode. Uh, cooperative, which is you work as a group together, uh, and then solo mode, right? As with cooperative play, you don't need a GM, a lone heroic character in a dangerous world. I'm excited about solo mode personally because I feel like it could be a thing that I could do on stream, right? Like I could be like, all right, everybody, we're going to play Iron Sworn. Come hang out while I do that, right? Like that, yeah, that to me is is pretty interesting it's not even a one-on-one -on -one session it's a one-on-zero session yeah 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 so that seems kind of cool um again we we come to games with our own personal approaches so part of these part of these first looks is what value does this game have to me as a person right i'm not i'm not unbiased i'm i'm very biased as will be everybody who looks at this game so what do we need to play uh the the game itself Two ten-sided dice, one six-sided die, another pair of tens for oracle dice, or I guess the same pair of tens, um, and then counters for marking status. Cool. All right. Sure. Um, Iron Sworn is heavily reliant on the fiction, where the imagined characters, situations, and places exist in the game. You will play from the perspective of your character. You will interpret events and actions in a way that is consistent with the dramatic fictional reality you have forged in your story and in your world. For more on how mechanisms and fiction interact, see page 203. Okay, well, we'll get there. Uh, cool. All right. So... Default assumptions about the setting before we start like ripping it apart. Here's what we need to know about the setting in which this game takes place. Two generations ago, your people were driven to the Irelands from their former home. Okay, we don't know why, but we used to two generations ago. We lived somewhere else. Now we live here. Uh, the weather here is harsh. Winter is brutal. Rugged terrain makes travel and trade difficult and dangerous. There are no thriving city. Uh, we live in villages. Um, many areas are unexplored and uninhabited, except by the firstborn. Okay. Elves, giants, and Varu. Uh, coins have little value. We barter instead. Communities are isolated and independent. There is a diverse mix of people and culture within the Iron Land, even within a single community. You can envision your character and those you interact with however you like, unbound by considerations of geography, lineage, sexual orientation, and gender. Cool, okay. Uh, communities sometimes band together, but there are no kingdoms. Territory is sketchy. Large-scale warfare is unheard of, but raiding parties between communities uh, is a constant menace, right? Some communities subsist entirely on raiding. Ooh, they sound like jerks. Spear, shield, axe, and bow are common uh, dominant weapons. Swords are rare and highly prized. Magic is subtle and mysterious. Supernatural creatures and beasts are rare, frightening, and dangerous. Perfect, right? This is great. I love this. Because what this says is, if you do not adjust any of these dials, this is what the game looks like. But it also tells us you can adjust all of these, right? These are the core settings, right? We have various thematic things at certain levels, right? But if you want to, you could turn supernatural creatures all the way down. You could increase the size of communities. You could adjust the economy. Some of these are dials you can you can mix up, right? But it says, by default, this is the game, right? You're encouraged to make Iron Sworn your own and bend the setting to your liking. Your version will be unique because you define aspects such as the history of your people, magic, mythic beasts, and more. So for example, if you wanted to have, yes, the, the world has a diverse mix of people and culture, but if you wanted to envision a village where uh, people, where like trans people of all other communities uh, have come to live together and support each other, you could put that in. Even though by default, the the, the setting in, uh, imagines that each, each community may have a mix of uh, various genders and sexual orientations. You could say a particular community is uh, focused on one one particular way, and that's an adjustment of that dial. These feel to me like the rule the rules you set down at the beginning of a game of microscope. Um, and most games already have this, right? Most games already have these things, but they're very very rarely laid out like this. 
what are your in the game that you're running at home or the game you were playing, whatever RPG you played last, would you be able to make a list of these things about your setting? Right? Would you be able to do this in your in your campaign setting? I wonder what this would look like to me if I did one for Court of Swords or Far Verona. I think it's very useful. Um, especially when you're making a game where you want people to adapt the rules and the setting, give them a baseline and then give them tools to make adjustments to it, which this game does on page 237, right? Specific advice on how to hack the game. One of my pet peeves is when games say, here's the default, here's the mechanisms. Your job is to adjust them however you like. And you're like, all right, I'll do it. I will take on that job. And you go to the back looking for the hacking chapter and you're like, oh, there isn't any. You just want me to do it, but you're not going to tell me how. Right? Yeah, it's great. It's really good to have this like right at the beginning and lay it out. And yeah, and that's the idea is that you do this adjustment of the setting as a group. You get it with the people you play with. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, we talked about how the vows are super important uh, when we were looking at the marketing material. So in the Ironlands, a vow is sacred. You declare a solemn promise to do something. Your word is your bond. Wu-Tang forever. Uh, when you swear a vow, you touch a piece of iron uh, and your vows drive you. You'll get experience and gain new abilities by pursuing your vows. When you create a character, you start with a background vow. When you set up your campaign, you envision or encounter an inciting incident that triggers a new vow. Oh, this is fate character creation, right? I'm seeing that thing where it's like, all right, what vow have you already sworn? What vow will you swear when the game begins? And then when we move on, what other vows do we do we do? Right. So they've tied swearing the vow into both backstory and character action. And I think that's very cool. That's very strong. So we're going to use our character sheet to track our stuff. We're going to have assets, which are abilities we choose when we create our character. My understanding is that the assets are available on cards, which would be cool to look at. Uh, your character is more than these mechanical bits. Uh, you have hopes and fears. You have a history. You are or were a part of a community. This is the fiction of your character. Consider these details when you create your character, but don't sweat it. You'll evolve it through play. Ah, addressing the Chungus Grungus divide, right? This is a game in which you have a background vow and very little else, and you will fill out the rest as you play your character. Good. Okay. Interesting. So here's our character sheet. Um, we got momentum, right? Tracking on the left. We got our five stats, edge, heart, iron, shadow, and wits. Some of these make sense. Some of these I could guess at, but others, others I might not be able to. Like, I'm not sure what I would roll shadow for. Maybe it's stealth stuff. Maybe it's like lying and sneaking. Heart is maybe empathy or like bravery, but then iron. Anyway, they're evocative, right? I'm curious to see what those are about. And then we have other trackers on this side, which are health, spirit, and supply. All right? So there's the two trackers on the sides. There's experience. There's bonds. And then, yeah, they weren't lying, right? Look at the middle of the... the most of the character sheet is taken up by your, by your vows. Yeah. And then down here, banes, burdens, and conditions. Uh, that you will take as you face harrowing challenges. It's an evocative character sheet. I like it. This this is bold. This is cool, making your vows like most of the sheet. I like it. Quests and suffering. Yep. <laughs> cool. All right. So moves are self-contained systems. Um, there's a move for a common situation. They have specific triggers when you blank, when a character blank, when you encounter blank, you look at the move. So... Apocalypse world style, do the thing when the thing comes up in the fiction. There are adventure moves, relationship moves, combat moves, suffer moves, quest moves, and fate moves. Fate moves help you decide what happens in solo and co-op play or support the GM's decision and brainstorming in guided play. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. When a move's name is referenced, you'll see it as italicized text. Some moves measure your headway against a challenge using a progress track. When you're ready to resolve the challenge, make a progress roll. 
Other moves utilize an oracle roll. Oh, I see. Interesting. So it's like when you when you do a certain thing, make an oracle roll. Ah, oh, this is fascinating. Okay. All right, let's go. Let's keep looking. So here's what a move looks like, right? Name of the move. This is a very nicely designed book. The the layout is quite clear, uh, very clean, and they're not afraid to give a concept a whole page to work out. I, I like that quite a lot, right? Like, I could see this being jammed into a half page in another game. What's the do we does anybody own the physical version of this game? What's the format? Is it a is it like a big D&D book or is it like a smaller like burning wheel form factor? I'm curious. Uh, I know it's like 200 and almost 300 pages. So I'm imagining that it's like a smaller, like thicker book. But the layout from the of the PDF just from looking at this is very nice. Yeah. Um, so this is a move. It looks like what you expect, right? Strong hit, weak hit on a miss. And here's again Source says it's six by nine. Okay. So again, here's another nice, clean, nice, clean page, right? Challenge dice are D10s. Action dice uh, is a D6. Uh, you add your relevant stat to the action die. So instead of 2D6 plus a stat, it's one. Also, yes, let's all, let's all be appreciative of the page eight core mechanic. Very nice. Thank you for not bearing this 100 pages after all the setting material. But also remember, the game is empowering us to make our own settings. So there's no reason to bury us in lore first thing. What matters is that we understand the game. Okay, so add your relevant stat to your action die. The move will tell you which stat to add or give you a choice. Some will tell you to use one of your tracks, such as health or supply, in place of a stat. Based on the move, your character's assets, you have the opportunity to apply one or more bonuses called adds. The total of your action die, your stat, and any adds is your action score. The action score is never greater than 10. Anything over that is ignored. So you roll a d6. Then you add one of your stats. Then I assume the adds are fictional or situational. That's your action score. To determine the outcome of the move, compare the action score to each of the challenge dice. You want it to be greater than the individual value of those dice. Interesting. So you roll 2d10 and a d6 and then do some math based on that. This is a very interesting. I this is this is one of those systems where because of the way my brain works, I look at it and my brain is like, this seems cool, but I have no fucking clue how this works at the table. Like whether or not this creates what kind of fiction this creates versus like a 2d6 or a d20. So it's kind of, it's like roll over both D10s. This is so weird. I It's so weird I have to try it. I wonder if, let me see if I can, see if I can get a, I, I just, I can't not. So dice roller, I think Google has one, right? Yeah, let's, let's do, let's do this. Give me this dice roller here, Google. Um, Okay, let's do, let's do a, let's do a roll. So you roll a D6 and say we're adding like four, right? So we'd roll, uh, let's roll, uh, automatically adds this number. Okay, roll that. So we got a seven and then we got to roll two D10. Oh, these are probably adding as well. Okay, so we have a seven, which means we're higher than one of our D10s, but lower than another. Right. It's actually almost just like the example. And plus four would be quite high. So this is how we get a, what, a partial? Oh, interesting. So it's it's using the same framework as Powered by the Apocalypse, where it's like, if you are higher than none of your dice, it's a miss. If you're higher than one of the D10s, it's a weak hit. And if you're higher than both the D10s, it's a strong hit. And if somehow you manage to get a 10 on your D6, you're going to get, there's no way you're going to get a, anything better or anything worse than a full hit, right? Because of being average good at something is usually plus two or plus three. So we'll look at the modifiers as we go. Interesting. That's quite cool. Okay. All right. I don't fully understand the math, but that's a product of my life. That's how it works. But okay, cool. 
So a strong, here we go, strong hit. Action score is greater than both the dice. Weak hit, you succeed with a lesser effect or a cost. Miss is you don't get higher than either of the dice. And the move will tell you how to interpret the action. When you score a miss, you'll usually see a prompt to pay the price. A special move that lets you pick a likely negative outcome or roll to see what happens. If you're playing with a GM, oh, I see. So what they've done to make this a solo game is if you if you fall on a miss, you don't need a GM because the move you're making tells you exactly what to do. So pay the price. If you pay the price on, I don't know, fighting in melee, you might have to roll on the wound table. It's a, it's a nice iteration on the PBTA format. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has to be greater than, I greater than, not equal to. So if your action score is 10 and you roll two tens, you still miss. See a prompt to pay the price. Pay the price is a special move. Ah, uh, I see. So it's like, if you fail, you can pay the price, and that's a different move. Interesting. Okay, all right. Cool. Ties always go to the challenge dice. Your action score needs to exceed, not equal them, to be a hit. When you roll for a move, you should be on the lookout for a match. In cooperative and solo play, this is your trigger to add a twist, create a new complication, otherwise mix things up. Oh, so like you're starting to hybridize powered by the apocalypse and then other systems that look for dice synergy to create nuance in the narrative. So it's like when you roll, if you roll two fives on your challenge dice, succeed, fail, strong hit, weak hit, doesn't matter. Something interesting happens, like an additional twist will come up regardless of what else is going on. If you're unsure, ask the Oracle. Okay, cool. Right. And a strong hit match should represent a twist, a strong hit, uh, or a, a match on a miss, heighten negative outcome, complication, or danger. You can also let the intensity of your success or failure frame how you interpret the match. Match tens, harrowing turn of events. It's as bad as things get. So it's like a narrative crit or failure. I feel like that that gif from the wire right now. Like I don't I don't know if it's good or bad. I'd have to play it, but I can certainly see where it might be interesting. And that for me that's that's got that's gave got you got my attention, Iron Sworn. This seems pretty cool. So if you're playing as the GM, focus on guiding the game, responding to your players' questions and actions since NPCs don't make moves. You don't have to make action rolls, but you might want to make oracle rolls sometimes. So momentum value ranges from minus six to plus 10. It represents how you're faring in your quests. These are, they're, they're like, I assume like countdown clocks, but player facing and like more deeply mechanical. I wonder if this kind of thing would be useful for like Court of Swords so that... Dan and JP and, and Max and Zeke could know how far along, how much momentum they have in pursuing their goals. Let's see how the mechanism works. So you track it on the side of your character sheet. When you have positive momentum, things are going your way. When you have negative momentum, you're facing tough odds. Momentum persists through scenes and between gaming sessions. Make sure you write it down. Okay, so it doesn't clear or return. You gain momentum when you make moves. If a move tells you to add momentum, right, take plus X, you increase the track by that value. In general, plus one momentum is a minor advantage, plus two is a big deal. You lose it as a choice. Oh, shit. So it's like, this This gives you a currency to frame up moves, right? If you, if you, if you get a weak hit, you get what you want, but minus two momentum, one harm, or some other thing. Okay, all right. If you lose momentum as a result of a narrative outcome with the defined value, suffer a reduction appropriate to the circumstances, right? Major or minor, minus one, minus two, okay. You can also burn momentum. When you have positive momentum, you can cancel any challenge die less than your current momentum value. 
If both challenge dice, you can cancel them both for a strong hit. If you burn momentum when only one is less, it gives you a weak hit. For example, if your momentum track is at plus six, your action score is a four, you roll a five and an eight, burn momentum to cancel the five, resulting in a weak hit. Okay, I think I think I get it. How much does it cost when you burn? Oh, everything. Burning momentum is never required. After you burn momentum, you must reset your momentum. Okay. Default to plus two. Interesting. So we're always kind of like moving ahead, right? Our momentum resets to plus two. Debilities are conditioned. Let's see. The value may be lowered when you suffer from a debility. Debilities are conditions such as wounded, shaken, or unprepared. If you have one debility, your reset is plus one. If you have more than one debility, your momentum reset is zero. Got it. Okay. When your momentum is less than zero, and it matches the value of your action die, cancel the action die. Wow, okay. So it's only if they match. This is a, this is complicated. It's like a um, it's like PBTA and the one roll engine. Like you make a single roll and it it has a lot to say. So I guess if your momentum is negative six, you're not canceling dice that are one, two, three, four, or five. You're only gonna drop sixes. And you don't want to roll sixes because then that die just doesn't count. And chances are pretty good you're going to fail unless you roll very low on the 2d10. This game is making that roll put in work. And I think that's cool. I think that's, I might, that could be something good. We'll see. This, this kind of thing is very, very difficult. Like I find one roll engine very fiddly, but it's also not built on the, powered by the apocalypse framework so i don't know maybe maybe it works we'll see okay so you still get your stat and your ads exactly that's right yeah okay um you make moves like secure an advantage to increase your momentum yeah 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 okay all right max momentum starts at plus 10 it's reduced by one for every marked ability right so as you get fucked up your momentum goes down a progress track measures your pace to determine the outcome of a goal or challenge when you swear an iron vow this is how far along you are when you undertake a journey when you enter the fray basically whenever you start doing something you start a you start a progress track a row of 10 boxes since a progress track may stretch over many sessions, it includes progress tracks for vows. You create a progress track for your bonds. Right, so that's, let me go back. That's all of this stuff. Your bonds is one thing, your vows, one thing. Right, okay, so here's, here's our momentum. Here's our supply, our spirit, our health, here's experience, and then we track these, these vows. Okay, all right, cool. Good. Momentum. Interesting. Okay. All right. So when you engage in a fight, initiate a, a journey, swear a vow, etc., the you give your challenge a rank. You or the GM will choose a rank appropriate to the situation. How quickly or easily it can be resolved. Troublesome is used for simple challenges. Does this is this just how many boxes to autofill? Give your vows a rank appropriate. Uh, let's see. Guidelines for foes are 134. For journeys, page 111. Give your vows a rank appropriate to the complexity of your quest and the amount of emphasis you want to give the vow in your story. Ah, interesting. So this is um, Dogs in the Vineyard, right? This is the significance of the trait, not how useful it is. So if you have a vow to... Get back that damn pig my neighbor stole. That vow might be epic for you. You got to get that goddamn pig back. Jurgen stole my pig and my whole life is based around that that sow and getting my vengeance on Jurgen. But I also have a vow to 
I don't know, raise my son. But that that vow is only troublesome. My vow of parenthood is not as important to me as a player as my vow to spend the next 10 sessions getting my pig back from Jurgen. I guess I'll also be a decent parent, but it's not as important to me. Interesting. That's interesting. I like that, right? Sorry, don't mess with a man's pig. You could kidnap my son, but Jurgen, give me that pig back. We got to go ruin Jurgen's life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I dig it. Okay, let's see. We'll see how those complexities involve like how that comes up later um you'll perform specific moves to advance your goal as you travel across perilous lands you undertake a journey and mark progress when you reach waypoints got it okay so this is the undertake a journey move similarly when you fight you strike or clash to inflict harm on your foe to move forward in your quest use reach a milestone these incremental moves allow you to adv uh, amass advantages and have the best chance of success when you're ready to resolve your challenge. Oh, I see. So, theoretically, it's more boxes. The boxes stay the same, but the number of marks vary depending. Okay, all right. So you fill progress boxes with lines called ticks. A full progress box is four ticks in a star-shaped pattern. When a move tells you to mark progress, fill in the number of ticks according to the rank of your challenge. Right, more significance always means longer amount of time to fulfill the vow. So, a troublesome vow is 10 ticks, right? Or 10 boxes. Because each tick on a troublesome vow is a full box. But an epic vow is 40 boxes. Right? 10, 20, 30, no. 20, 30, 40, 50? Let me go back and look. It's a lot. Oh, troublesome is, oh, that's right. No, it's a third. Yeah, it's not one. Formidable is one. Oh, okay. So it's it's three boxes, two boxes, then ten boxes. I see. Okay, so if it's troublesome, let me zoom. Let me zoom in a little here. So a troublesome vow. Each time you tick, it goes one tick or like one success, two successes, three and a third. So you need to succeed basically four four times you advance it four times to fill it dangerous is one two three four five right okay and then formidable is 10 extreme is 20 and then epic is 40 i think so we'll see how many checks we get i think it's obviously it's based on successes right that is really putting like progress in the hands of the players I think because this I, I'm going to make a guess as we as we get through this, but I'm going to make a guess that because this game was developed for GM less play in a GM environment, it puts a lot of power in the hands of the players because the game is used to just not having the GM at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, all right. So if you're marking progress, you make the move. Let's see, four moves called progress moves. To resolve a quest, you fulfill your vow. To end your journey, reach your destination. To decide the outcome of combat, end the fight. When you retire, write your epilogue. Right, and those are moves. Reach your destination. When your destination comes to an end, roll challenge dice, compare it to your momentum. On a strong hit, make another move and add plus one. Take plus one momentum. On a weak hit, you arrive but face a hazard. On a miss, you've gone hopeless astray. You were misled about your destination, etc. Okay, and so you basically set you set yourself back to nothing if you totally blow it. If you you don't make an action roll when you make a progress move, instead tally the number of fully filled boxes, then roll challenge and compare. Interesting. So the closer you get to success, the easier it is to succeed. 
as with an action roll, your progress score is greater than both. It's a strong hit. If you beat one, it's a weak hit. If you fail to beat either die, it's a miss. In the example below, compare your plus six progress score to your challenge dice when making the move. The seventh box is only partly filled in and doesn't count. When do we make the progress move? When deciding whether or not to make it, you need to weigh your chance of success against the risk of continuing. Oh, I see. So you like push until you think that you have enough to like make the win move, but you can fall back as you attempt to progress. So if you come in hard, alpha strike the challenge, build up as much progress as possible, you want to bail out fast, but if you don't come in real hard, if you don't swing in real hard at the beginning, you want to build your progress slowly, but the more times you need to make progress rolls, the harder it is to get over that hump to mechanically progress. Man, weird, weird and cool. If you and your allies are working together to resolve a challenge, you share a progress track and mark progress together. Totally makes sense. Yeah, you prepare as much as you need, but the world is going to keep going forward. This is almost like making fronts into a thing the players control. Interesting. Okay. Harm is physical damage and fatigue. You inflict harm on your foes in combat. You endure harm when you are attacked or fail to overcome a hazard or ordeal. When you, you successfully attack a foe using strike or clash moves, you inflict harm. If you're armed with a deadly weapon, you inflict two. If you're unarmed or improvised, you inflict one. You may be given the option to inflict more. Each point is marked as progress on the track. When you face harm, you make the move. Okay, uh, let's see. You face physical injury or hardship. You make the endure harm move. As part of it, you reduce your health track. There are five ranks of harm, right? Troublesome, dangerous, formidable, extreme, or epic. Great, okay, sure. So it's how much harm you take. When you're fighting a foe, they inflict harm based on their rank. When you're at zero health, a miss on the endure harm puts you at risk of suffering a debility. You recover health through resting. Stress is mental harm, right? Uh, also, we're getting our question answered. Most of the art in here is uh, photos, right? Altered photos. Okay, so these tracks, I'm gonna go back to the character sheet, right? Health, uh, health is over here as a thing. Here are debilities. This is what we were talking about before, right? So that's, uh, that's health. Stress damages our spirit track. Okay, makes sense. Same, same. Um, and then assets. These are the cards we were talking about earlier. Um, they're special abilities. When you create your character, you select starting assets. When you gain experience, you advance, get new assets. They're little boxes of information. So when you pick an asset, it's a companion, a path, a talent, or a ritual. Most assets give you a default ability. They can modify existing moves. When you gain experience, you can upgrade existing assets. Oh, or buy new ones. Interesting. So by taking this path, I am now on the path of the Slayer. I get gather information and secure advantage. I get a plus one and a plus one momentum under certain circumstances. And if I upgrade... I can now be a level two slayer and either take swear an iron vow to swear a kill a beast or I can take the when I kill a beast, I get a bonus. That's so cool. So you you mix and match, right? These are advancements from a PBTA playbook, but I might take path of the slayer. I might also take an animal companion and then I might take a ritual uh, of tracking, right? Or I could take two combat talents, a duelist path, and um, a, uh, a squire, right? Oh, that's cool. 
Right, mix and match to make characters interesting. Uh, and then Oracle Dice, uh, this is your D100. You're going to roll on the oracular tables to help you answer questions in solo or co-op games or inspire the GM, right? If you are playing solo or co-op, you can ask the Oracle to guide your game session or trigger ideas when you need to know what happens. Its most basic function is to answer a yes or no question. Ah, aha, uh -huh, I see. So... The oracle in this acts like the deck of cards, right, in Archipelago. If you've played Archipelago, you know this already. If you haven't, you draw from the deck when something comes up and you look at it and the deck says, yes and, no and, no but, yes but, only if. And then, right, like they give you things that says like, yes, you get what you wanted, but you have to do something else. No, you don't get you what you wanted and it gets worse. Right. So this is the same thing. You roll the dice. You you. Uh, well, let's see how it works. When you seek to resolve questions, discover details in the world, determine how other characters respond or trigger encounters or events. You may draw a conclusion, decide the answer based on the most interesting and obvious results. Right. Ask a yes or no question. Decide the odds of yes and roll on the table below. Pick two, right? Rate one is likely and roll to see. Uh, or spark an idea, right? Brainstorm or use a random prompt. So rolling on this table using your Oracle dice will let you know, like, if I tell the mayor of this village that I will kill the troll for him, will he promise to set my pig free? I think there's probably a 50-50 chance he'll agree to these terms. Let's roll. Right? If I confront Jurgen with my sword in my hand and I demand that Jurgen give me my pig back, I think there's a small chance I could intimidate Jurgen. Let's roll and see. Right? And if you roll and you get a failure and a match... Maybe now Jurgen tries to kill me. Or maybe I learn he's already sold the pig to someone else. Right? God damn you, Jurgen. If you're playing with the GM, they're the oracle. When you see a prompt to ask them, turn to the GM and ask. Right? Keep, the, keep in mind that even when playing with the GM, Iron Sworn is about shared storytelling. Offer suggestions, talk it out. The GM is the final arbiter of what happens next, but everyone at the table should participate in building the world, creating the narrative. This is why, as a GM... I think this is a great tool, this likelihood tool, right? So if a player asks you, what's going to happen if I do this? You can turn it back on them and say, how likely is it that they, you think they're going to help you? And you can adjust according to your own needs, and then you can just roll if you can't decide, right? This is a form of what Vincent Baker would call disclaiming responsibility. So there's random tables that provide inspirational prompts in the game as well. This is a good rule. Trust your instinct, right? If it's interesting, dramatic, and push the story forward, make it happen. Don't worry too much about the random generators. I think the idea here is that, like, it's there to help you if you're not sure. If you need to ask the oracle, ask the oracle, right? If not, go ahead. So, as you explore the world, you create bonds with peoples and community by forging a bond. Bonds give you advantages for specific moves. Bonds help you determine your fate when you retire from your life. They have a special... Now, this is quite cool and says something about the game. This is one of those, what do the mechanics say about what the game is about? Keep, keep note, this is not Dungeon World, right? These bonds... There's only one of them. How connected to the world are you? That's it, right? It's not how well do you know Avon, how well do you know Bug, and how well do you know Throndir. It's how well connected to the world around you are you? How bonded to the world? How much of a murder hobo are you not, right? I'm wondering about that, right? That's what it seems to me. A singular bond score that tracks your fate being tied to the world. That's fascinating. I think that's really cool. If you're playing co-op 
or guided with others. Their characters are allies. A companion is a kind of asset. They can provide mechanical benefits and they do have a health track to record harm. Okay, all right. Uh, in Iron Sworn, uh, equipment is abstracted. Your supply track represents readiness, clothes, ammo, food, whatever. You are armed and armored as appropriate to your vision of the character. If you wield a weapon, you can inflict harm with it. If you're unarmed, you don't. Other equipment provides narrative benefit. It enables you to make moves where that gear is important or avoid a move altogether. If you are wearing a breastplate, right, and somebody stabs you in the chest... The move you are going to make will be different than if you are nude and someone stabs you in the chest, right? Fictional positioning. Do you face danger or not? God, look. Look, this art is awesome. What I really, what I'm really digging is the, it's the game at a glance definitely vibes Viking, right? Which usually... Nine times out of ten, when a game vibes Viking, the art in it is shield maidens and grizzled white dudes with beards. Right? Usually. Grizzled white dudes with beards, shield maidens. But this art still vibes very heavily Viking to me, right? Viking landscapes, kind of Viking clothes, right? It vibes that way, but the but the 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 characters, the people in the art are women and people of color, right? I think that's super cool. Cuz again, it goes back to that that um the the game setting is diverse even though it is inspired by something that we don't traditionally consider very diverse. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, so the flow of play, um you play primarily from the perspective of your character. What are you trying to do? That's not different. If you're doing something covered by a move, make the damn move. Scoring a strong hit, you're in control of the narrative. A weak hit or a miss, you're not in total control. Keep that in mind whether you're playing alone or with a... That's it. This is what I wanted. This is the page that I wish we had included in Dungeon World. This is the page that I didn't design until well after the game had been released, right? Powered by the Apocalypse and Dungeon World both, like Apocalypse World and Dungeon World, we both needed this page. But I don't think that the model had existed long enough for us to figure that out. But this is the this is the page, right? How do you play this game? Here it is. All right, so that's the basics of the game. 28 pages in, we got the basics, we understand. This is what we do. We make characters, we build the world, we review the moves, look at the example of play, swear an iron vow, play to see what happens and then dig deeper into some of the optional and additional stuff. Hell yeah. Right? Your character. Pretty damn cool. So what are our principles for making our character, right? First of all, we got to be awesome. <laughs> your character is competent, right? Your character is smart, brave, and driven. You can hold your own in a fight. When you swear an iron vow, you mean it. You're not without limitations. You'll swear, uh, you'll face hardship. You make bad decisions. You'll fail. Overcoming those failures is what makes you heroic. Okay, nice, clear understanding of like what characters in this game are about. Uh, be who you want. The characters in this game, people of this world are diverse. Communities are formed through shared interest, mutual protection, or strong leadership. Respect is paid to the traditions of the old world, but Ironlanders left behind their cultural divisions when they crossed the vast northern ocean. We're not in Denmark anymore. Even within a single community, you'll find a fusion of old world and Ironland influences. You can envision your character however you want. They might be inspired directly by a real world or historical culture, or weave a blend of cultural influences into your conflict. The default setting is human-centric. The rules do not include options to play fantasy races, but you can adjust to your liking. The mechanisms of your character are relatively light and can be themed to support several types of fantasy or historical fiction. I think that's interesting, and it's certainly worth reading word by word as we look at it.